Ciao a tutti ragazzi, benvenuti, bentrovati, come state amici miei? Oggi è tempo di Nair Cultura, però una Nair Cultura un po' diversa, un po' più particolare come quando abbiamo avuto Casa Rosa, è una Nair Cultura che prevede anche un'intervista, un'intervista a un pezzo da 90 dell'animazione americana, perché oggi parleremo niente po' po' di meno che con Chris Williams, per chi non lo conoscesse, per quasi 25 anni ha lavorato nel mondo della Disney, ha lavorato in Disney, ha lavorato come storia artist ha dei filmetti così piccolini tipo Mulan, Le Follie dell'Imperatore, Lilo e Stitch, ha diretto Bolt, ha co-diretto Big Hero 6 e Oceania. Insomma, una persona così e eh, ovviamente ha vinto anche il premio Oscar come miglior film d'animazione per Big Hero 6 perché ovviamente ne era il co-regista. Io ho pensato bene di farci una chiacchierata dato che secondo me la sua esperienza ventennale può in un certo senso aiutarci e farci scoprire come si lavora all'interno di una major, la major forse dell'animazione mainstream. Quindi ragazzi non perderei altro tempo e direi di dare il benvenuto a Chris Williams ma prima di questo ovviamente sigla! Ciao Chris, grazie di essere qui Chris, è un onore per me, sono molto emozionato di poter eh, chiacchierare con una persona che ha lavorato a così alti livelli nel mondo dell'animazione. Thank you very much, the, the honor is mine, I'm very excited to, to speak with you, I, I love people who love animation, so, so let's go. <ride> grazie mille Chris, allora partiamo proprio dalla Disney, dato che è stata la casa che, che per prima ti ha accudito, come ci sei arrivato? Perché molti vedono il lavorare in Disney come una missione quasi impossibile, no? con ehm, provini, test, insomma, eh, robe molto stringenti per poter accedervi e poterci lavorare. Qual è invece stato il tuo percorso per entrare in Disney? Back when I was a kid, like a lot of people in animation, I loved drawing and writing and I used to make little stop motion movies with my dad in my bedroom and I was just obsessed with movies. My mom was very concerned about what I would do for a living and it was her that suggested that I i study animation and, and try to pursue it as a career. So I studied animation in uh, Canada, where I'm from, and then I had an opportunity to, um, to work at, at Disney Animation in the story department. And I didn't have much notice. They called me and said they had a, an opportunity that started in, I think, two weeks. So I had to make a big decision to, to leave my friends and my family and my home and fly to Los Angeles and start a new life there. I didn't really um, uh, imagine that I would spend the next 25 years of my life working at Disney, uh, but that's what happened. I had a great experience. I was always uh, treated well. I made great friends. I still have uh, great friends who work there. I was very, very fortunate. Ti hai parlato di ossessione per l'animazione, ma che cos'è che ti ha reso ossessionato? C'è stato un corto, un film, un regista, uno studio, forse addirittura Disney stessa, che ti ha portato ad affascinarti così tanto Specifically, there was a type of movie that I loved, which was the epic adventure story. So I loved the old uh, Ray Harryhausen stop motion films. Uh, I remember really loving the Sinbad movies. Of course, Raiders of the Lost Ark was a really big event in my life. And King Kong, I was obsessed with King Kong. I loved Clash of the Titans, the original Clash of the Titans. Uh, I loved the, the stop motion animation uh, in, in that movie. And then later, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, I really came to appreciate. As, as a really great film. I really responded to movies and stories where characters leave the known world venture off into the unknown. Ecco, torniamo appunto ai film, perché in Disney hai lavorato con, come story artist a Mulan, Le Folie dell'Imperatore e Lilo e Stitch. Tre film molto particolari, diciamo unici nell'era rinascimentale, post-rinascimentale della Disney. I was very fortunate in my timing and, and I think the animation industry has grown so much since I went to animation school. When people thought of animation, they thought of cartoons and Saturday morning cartoons and it was considered just for, for young kids. And it's been an amazing few decades and to see where animation is now has been incredible. Um, and I can get into the, my specific, specific experiences with each of those movies if you'd like. Sì, sì, e io volevo partire proprio da Mulan, perché uh, Mulan è, è stato un film che ha anticipato un po' i tempi, appunto, come diceva Chris, i tempi che stiamo vivendo adesso, perché era una donna, cioè non era la principessa che voleva l'amore del principe, ma era una donna che voleva l'amore del padre, voleva essere rispettata, uh, anche se nata donna, e addirittura rinuncia ad essere donna per poter dimostrare il suo valore, no? In battaglia, e poi infatti salva, salva l'impero. Ecco, ci 
puoi raccontare quali erano gli umori e le convinzioni delle persone che hanno lavorato a Mulan e qual è stato il tuo contributo nella produzione del film? Yeah, it, it, felt, it felt exciting and new at the time and I'll, I'll start by saying that when I started on Mulan, I was a story artist, I was part of the story team on Mulan. I was really inexperienced. I was young, I didn't know what I was doing, right? I had a lot to learn. And so I moved down to Los Angeles, I started working at Disney and suddenly I was surrounded by all of this incredible art on the walls and I was working with so many insanely talented people and it was it was kind of intimidating but also really motivating you know it made me want to get better and so even though I was I was pretty inexperienced I was willing to work hard to to improve and and to get better and to contribute I don't know I, I guess I just I earned my keep just through sheer will you know I just decided I was going to work hard and I was going to dedicate myself to learning the craft of story and storyboarding and just to follow up on your question I think at the time it probably was uh, a bit more of a limited sense of what a, a, a female protagonist uh, could be in animation and maybe in movies more broadly. And so the idea that she was going to become this very powerful warrior and a leader, that felt really cool and really exciting to me. And I can say one more thing about my experience in Mulan, which is that working in the story department on a movie, it takes years, right? And in the course of working on Mulan, we kept reinventing the story and changing things. And we would storyboard scenes and throw it out. And we kept changing the structure of the movie. And I remember thinking at the time when I was young that I was getting the, probably the most challenging one out of the way early, which was great. You know, since then, I've come to realize how naive I was and that they're all hard. Story is always hard. Every movie is going to be its own challenge. And now I've come to appreciate that that's just part of it. Ecco, e a proposito di film che sono stati eh, cambiati, cestinati del tutto nel tempo, ovviamente bisogna parlare anche delle foglie dell'imperatore perché era un film inizialmente epico, solenne, che si chiamava eh, Kingdom of the Sun, che a un certo punto si è trasformato in un film demenziale, è un altro unicum possiamo dire in casa Disney eh, nonostante ci sia un documentario che spiega tutta la storia della produzione di Kingdom of the Sun che si chiama Sweet Box che è del 2002 ci puoi raccontare come si è arrivati a questa metamorfosi drastica? Yeah, and I'd worked on both versions of that movie and was around for the big change that was a big chapter in, in Disney history I would say. Initially the movie was meant to be more music maybe more solemn as you described it more more grand more uh, epic. like the lion king i think yeah yeah totally it was going to be more in that range of, of of the of the disney movies that were being made at the time but the story just wasn't coming together in the way that we were all hoping and and we really loved and respected the director roger allers but we just couldn't get it to 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 gel and come together and so a decision was made to try to go in a very different direction we got to a point where we'd spent most of our time and most of our money and had to come up with a movie <laughs> and so i was part of the a, a small team of people that presented a, a new idea which was what if we made something that's very just a fun cartoon what if we just went pure comedy very broad very silly can hopefully make it a, a great movie but but really leaning, leaning into comedy and tonally much more like the the Looney Tunes cartoons than anything that Disney had done and at the time it felt pretty revolutionary um i think nowadays people do associate a reverent comedy with feature animation but at the time that wasn't really done so what we were pro proposing did feel pretty radical and there was a big build up to to this day where Myself and, and the director, uh, Mark Dindle, and the writer, Dave Reynolds, we pitched a, this, this crazy version, and we pitched a really silly outline of the story, and we pitched a, a silly scene that was an example of what we were going to go for tonally, as far as the comedy goes. And, and our bosses at the time, they really responded to it. And uh, so we were then off to the races. And, and like I said, we had so little time to make the movie that we didn't have time to really second guess ourselves or to ponder or worry too much about the decision making and i think that is the reason why there's this this really pretty fun and freewheeling tone that the movie has no, e sono convinto che sia diventato un cult grazie all'on video perché inizialmente la critica e il pubblico rimase un po' tiepidino e poi grazie alla VHS insomma poi mi pare c'erano già i DVD e al noleggio è diventato un cult e ancora oggi viene ricordato dai fan dell'animazione come un classicone insomma yes I agree and I never saw that in, in my, my future uh, it's really the one cult movie that I've worked on somehow we 
We made a cult movie within the confines of Disney, which is not their bread and butter, right? But it, it's fun. It, it found a, 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 a really an audience outside of the the typical Disney audience. I was really excited about that. I, I love that it, that it sort of found its way. Parliamo di un altro cult, ovvero Lilo e Stitch, eh, che rappresenta un altro esperimento in casa Disney. Eh, quella Disney che a metà degli anni 90 decise di lasciare un po' più libertà ai registi per la sperimentazione di generi, stili, mood, penso a Hercules, Atlantis, Tarzan e, pu- e poi appunto a-, a Stitch. Secondo te, in questa Disney di adesso, la Disney contemporanea, che sembra un po' più quadrata e che controlli di più i suoi dipendenti, si potrà mai tornare a una sperimentazione così bella come quella dell'epoca? Well, that, that's a good question. I think it's probably not just Disney. I think the entire movie industry is a little conservative right now, uh, a little careful in their decision making. I think that the uh, there's so much money on the line and that I think that, that people do get a little nervous about taking risks. So I wouldn't just isolate that to Disney. And uh, and, and so, yeah, it, then it falls to directors and artists and, and writers to, to, to fight against that, you know, and to try to push the boundaries of, of what can be done. And, and there's always going to be that, that a little bit of that opposition of people being a little conservative and careful about the things that are being made and the things that, are, that people are spending money on. And that also this desire to do something, to create something new. And I think if you look at movies like Spider-Verse, you know, what, what Chris and Phil were able to, to do with that movie, uh, or Mitchell's versus Machines, another movie that they, they'd worked on, um, that it's possible to, to break through and to make things that are really special, even though it has become a little bit more of a conservative industry. A proposito di qualcosa di diverso, a un certo punto ti trovi a dirigere il tuo primo film, ovvero Bolt. Ecco, che cosa hai imparato da quando hai iniziato a lavorare in Disney fino alla realizzazione di Bolt e soprattutto quali sono stati i passaggi che poi ti hanno permesso di dirigere il tuo film, la, di, di raccontare la tua storia? Sure, I mean, that was one of the things I experienced at Disney was the, the, the CG computer animation revolution, right? That happened on, on our watch. And so we had to relearn filmmaking all over again, you know, it's, it's such a different way to make a movie. And with Big Hero 6 specifically, a good friend of mine, Don Hall, was the other director on that movie. And he loves the superhero genre. He grew up loving the Marvel comics. And he was really excited about the thought of telling a, a story using the Marvel characters. And so he really explored the never ending library of, of Marvel characters before he found Big Hero 6. Vorrei fare un passo indietro rispetto a Big Hero 6, appunto parlando di Bolt, perché Bolt è il terzo classico Disney in CGI dopo l'esperimento Dinosaur, insomma, di e quindi Chris ti sei ritrovato a cavallo tra l'abbandono dell'animazione tradizionale e l'avvento della CGI imperante in casa Disney. Secondo te adesso nelle major, nella major Disney è possibile un ritorno all'animazione tradizionale oppure è il caso di perdere ogni speranza? Well, I, I sure hope so. I think everyone who loves animation has a, an affection for um, uh, 2D animation and And certainly you, you, uh, Miyazaki has continued to, to carry the torch and, and, and make great movies. And I think it's, it is possible. And I think there's still a lot of really talented animators out there that would love to jump on an, any animated project. And I know Sergio uh, is making movies for Netflix that are very much 2D. And he's able to gather some of the greatest 2D animators all around the world. And they're making, they're continuing to make 2D films. And, and I think they're being received, you know, the, the very well. And it's pretty amazing when you, when you see the quality of the animation in his movies, he can tap into the very best on, on the planet. So yeah, I think there's still an audience and an appetite for it. And, uh, And I think it'll never, it'll never go away. Anche in Francia c'è molta animazione tradizionale ancora, però il Giappone diciamo che ultimamente è diventato un po' il portavoce ecco, dell'animazione tradizionale nel mondo. Speriamo che anche Disney torni un po' sui suoi passi, è un peccato. I, I interrupted you, I'm sorry, but I just, I, speaking of 2D animation, I can't believe I didn't think of the movie I Lost My Body. It's a movie that you can, you can watch on Netflix and, and it's one of the best movies I've seen in a very long time. The shots are, are so original and so breathtaking, the story is amazing and I was just so won over by it. So I hope everybody who loves animation uh, checks out I Lost My Body. Sì, sì, poi c'è anche Song of the Sea, eh, insomma c'è, ci sono altri registi che tentano di, di fare dell'animazione 2D un, uh, un, diciamo una tecnica ecco, ancora appetibile per il pubblico. E ecco, a proposito di Miyazaki, eh, voglio parlare del tuo Totoro, cioè eh, appunto Baymax con Big Hero 6, che è diretto con Don Hall. È un film molto diverso da, da Bolt, perché si sente l'influenza superioristica americana, come avevi detto te prima, c'è anche tanto fattore anime, secondo me, eh, e, e poi 
poi c'è un dramma familiare alla base che muove anche la storia all'inizio anche tecnicamente sembra che ci sia un abisso tra questi due film ecco quali erano gli scopi di Disney quando si sono approcciati a, a un film così particolare come Big Hero 6 yeah it also has a giant inflatable nurse robot so we threw everything into this movie um <laughs> It's, uh, again, it started with uh, my friend Don Hall's real passion for the genre. He loves superhero movies. And so it really started with his, his passion. And he asked me to join him uh, in making the movie. I think the, the idea that it was a new genre for us was very exciting. You know, I mean, it opens new doors and, uh, as, as far as the tone goes. But I also love that there's, there's this sense that, that there were so many different elements coming together. You know, this sort of... this. Uh, the influence of, of Western and, and Eastern animation and, 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 and culture, the idea that it was a superhero genre, but then you had this big, adorable, inflatable robot in the middle of it. There was no other movie like it. And it's somehow by making a genre film, it opened up new doors for originality for us. So yeah, I'm really, really proud of, of how that movie turned out. And I had a great experience working with my friend Don. And it also opened the door for, to push on the action scenes. When I was a kid, I loved, I loved the Mad Max films. Uh, I'm, I'm very much uh, influenced by, by George Miller and his approach to action. And there, I think for a long time in animation at Disney, there was a sense that you just kind of do what, what, is, what is necessary in the course of an action scene. And the idea of just celebrating action and really pushing on the scenes to make them more dynamic and more exciting, that wasn't something we really did too much. Beh, questa cosa secondo me si vedeva anche Chris in Bolt dove hai, hai realizzato delle scene di inseguimento folli con il criscetto nella palla, il gatto che insomma c'erano delle robe veramente folli quindi già si dimostravano un po' le tue intenzioni nel fare questi inseguimenti folli al limite del, del credibile, del surreale Yeah, I do find that I was oftentimes a, a voice for pushing on the action scenes to make them just bigger more grand, more, more daring hopefully. The experience of watching The Road Warrior or Mad Max Max 2 is probably what it was called over there. <laughs> um, it was, uh, it, it left an impression on me. And I remember I saw the, the Mad Max 2 poster before I was old enough to see the movie. And I remember just studying that poster, just being obsessed with it. And I thought, I, when I finally get to see this movie, I think I'm going to love it. And I did. It, it exceeded my expectations. And I've, I may have watched that movie more than any other movie ever made. There's just something about those incredible stunts, the choreography of the action scenes that is unlike anything you've ever seen before. There's something in George Miller that made him always push to go, to go further. You know what I mean? How can this be bigger? How can this be better? How can this be more exciting? But at the same time, as a filmmaker, he always carves, he always carves out quiet moments and intimate moments as well to balance it out. Um, so I've always been very much influenced by, by his work. Mi fa ridere che ehm, ti abbia ispirato George Miller per Bolt e Big Hero 6 e poi George Miller abbia fatto i film d'animazione e ha fatto Happy Fit. Cioè, siamo un po' al paradosso, però è, è molto divertente questa, questa cosa. That's true, but I mean, one of the things that I admire about him is, is that he's, he has made very eclectic movies. Um, I know he didn't direct Babe, but he had a big hand in Babe, and, and that is one of my favorite movies. And there's something just so sweet and, and pure and good about it. It's one of the quietest climaxes in movie history, but it's so moving, and it's just so emotionally powerful. And so to go from, you know, directing The Road Warrior or Mad Max 2 to working on a movie like Babe, it just shows the 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 breadth of his of his abilities you know and i love those kind of movies as well i love babe and paddington 2 i don't know if you've seen paddington 2 but that's one of my all-time favorite movies and it's it's so gentle and sweet in its tone and so i, I certainly have an appetite for those kind of movies as well no sono d'accordo anche perché nonostante non abbia diretto il primo george miller ha diretto il capitolo migliore di babe che è il secondo babe va in città che è un film assurdo e che ti fa capire veramente che un regista può mettere mano a, se è bravo può mettere mano a quello che, che vuole ecco questo è and certainly he can ti sempre insieme a donola hai co-diretto oceania tra l'altro insieme a altri due registi che sono ron clemens e john masker che sono dei registi leggendari in casa Disney che hanno diretto Sirenetta, Aladdin, Hercules, Pianeta del Tesoro eccetera insomma sono due leggende come è stato lavorare a fianco di questi due pesi massimi che hanno realizzato dei capolavori assoluti in casa Disney? It was a great experience and actually I was just emailing with uh, uh, John Musker and Ron Clements this morning so it's uh, so ah. we're still in touch they invited uh, again Don Hall my, my close friend Don Hall and, and myself to join them so there's four of us because it was it was just such a 
<laughs> a massive movie. And it was really a thrill uh, for me because one of the things that I always keep in mind is the fact that when I was going to school for animation a long time ago, part of the animation revolution that, that sort of created the Disney that we know today was their movies, um, The Little Mermaid and Aladdin. They connected with, with the audience in a really big way and got people really excited about um, animation and feature animation. And so they really got the ball rolling. In a sense, I I wonder would I even have a, a job or a career in animation if they hadn't made those movies, you know? So I was very, always very grateful um, for their contribution to animation history and feel like it probably on some level impacted me personally. So I was, I was really excited to be able to, to, to join them. And I can tell you a little bit how, how it happened. Um, very early on in the process, when Ron and John were working on the film, they knew that there was going to be a lot of animated water in the movie. And so they wanted to storyboard a little test that would allow them to work out some of the software and the tools that would allow them to animate the water in the very specific ways that they needed to. So they asked me just to storyboard something, some interaction between young Moana, baby Moana, and the ocean. And I had actually just been on a, a family vacation to San Diego, which is a town about two hours south of Los Angeles. And we were staying on the beach. And my daughter at that time was very young and she was about the age of the, the, the young toddler Moana. And so I would just sit on the beach and watch her interact with the waves, watch her play with the waves in the way that, that young kids that do. They have this fascination with the water. It was such a, a really a nice experience for me. And then shortly after that, Ron and John asked me to come up with a, to storyboard a test. And I knew exactly what to do. I basically, I, I, my daughter <laughs> became Moana and I storyboarded the test and they were really happy with it. And I think that they saw that there was something that I had to offer as far as the, the tonally Uh, to the movie. Allora, prima di passare al tuo nuovo film, eh, mi ha incuriosito una tua dichiarazione dove hai detto che Bambi è in infanzia è stato il tuo film preferito di sempre. Volevo capire perché. La risposta secondo me è abbastanza ovvia perché è veramente un capolavoro del cinema in generale, non solo del cinema di animazione, ma volevo sapere la tua, ecco. Yeah, I saw Bambi at a very young age and it's one of my earliest childhood memories that I can place. I remember the experience of watching it very vividly and of course it's a really sweet movie and And it really casts a spell. But then there's that moment where Bambi's mother dies. I was so obviously affected by it. Anybody who's seen that movie is affected by that moment. And we're all connected by our experience <laughs> with, with Bambi, you know. Is there any more powerful or potent an idea to express to a young kid than the idea that you are, your parents are going to die one day? And this idea that one generation replacing the next is such a a profound idea. It's something that I've taken with me through my career is, is to not be afraid to, to have potent, powerful uh, ideas in, in, your, in your movies. That's the reason why I, I, I sort of cite Bambi as, as a movie that was very important uh, to me. My mom tells me that after I saw that movie, I had so many questions about death. I was very suddenly uh, uh, aware of the idea of my own mortality. And, and it, it hit me at such an age that I don't think it's ever quite left me, this awareness that we only have a limited time. And so I, I feel like I've always felt like I, wanna, I want to pack in as much life as possible into the time that we have. You know, it's, it's, it's a reminder to me. It's always stayed with me as a reminder uh, to really appreciate life and enjoy life and to try to be As, as productive and, and engaged as possible with life. Proprio per questo uh, mi viene in mente una cosa che diceva sempre Walt Disney, cioè uh, cercare di spiegare ai bambini che nella vita ci possono essere tante soddisfazioni, tanta gioia, ma ci possono essere anche cose negative. Non aveva paura infatti Disney di rappresentare per esempio appunto la morte in Bambi, uh, la sofferenza di perdere momentaneamente la madre in Dumbo o anche addirittura um, tratteggiare un, un sabba satanico in fantasia. Nonostante tutto questo tempo, tempo uh, che l'animazione in cassa vende, è apprezzata, amata e criticata, viene vista ancora dal grande pubblico come un genere e non come una tecnica e quindi è difficile fare generi interni all'animazione perché le famiglie la vedono ancora come un prodotto per famiglia appunto per portare il bambino al cinema e farlo divertire secondo me però c'è una piccola inversione di tendenza la pensi come me Chris oppure c'è ancora tanto troppo lavoro da fare I'm at a place now where I've been in, in animation for 30 years and, and it's, a, it's a sort of a time to take stock and I think there's lots of um, reasons to be optimistic um, I think we've already under, undergone so much change Um, in animation, when you think about, again, where we were when I started out, people generally thought of it as just for kids, 
on TV, you know? And then Disney had this resurgence, the really well-structured, really sophisticated Pixar movies um, got made in, in, the, in the West here in North America. People started discovering the Miyazaki films. And then there's these great European movies like, um, like I Lost My Body and movies like Flea came along and, and, and they're really, really complex and sophisticated movies. And I think the audience has evolved with it. I think people think uh, of animation less and less as something that's just for kids. And so I think we still have a ways to go, but I think we've come so far and I'm, and I'm happy for that. Parliamo del tuo nuovo film per chiudere questa intervista, un film che hai diretto, scritto e prodotto, che è Il mostro dei mari, The Sea Beast. Quanto tempo ci è voluto per finirlo e qual è stato il punto di partenza e soprattutto come sei arrivato a fare un film così a 360 gradi? Netflix è forse una casa che può permettere ai registi di essere totalmente indipendenti nella produzione di un film d'animazione? I would say probably a little more so, a little bit more freedom. Um, uh, other studios tend to make, you know, one or maybe two projects a year and Netflix makes so many things that they allow um, a little bit more leeway as far as the, the tone of the projects. And as far as the, the Sea Beast, as I mentioned, the movies that I loved the most when I was younger were the, the big adventure stories like Raiders Lost Ark and King Kong. And so in the back of my mind, I always thought it'd be really great to to make an animated film that was that very much embraced that genre, very much was an action, a pure action adventure story. So that was always on my mind. And I also always loved those old maps and they would populate the ocean with these, with these really fanciful illustrations of sea monsters. And I always thought that would be an awesome world for animation. And so I thought, well, if no one else is going to do it, then I'll do it. And that became the springboard is I, I wanted to do it, something that was an action adventure as far as the genre goes. Um, and set in a world like that. Magari Chris, mh, ipotizzo, eh, ti sei ispirato magari anche ai mostri marini giganteschi che sono in One Piece, eh, perché sai, lì uh, ricoprono anche un punto cardine della trama. When we put the trailer out to the movie, there was a lot of comments about this One Piece. I, I, have, I have no idea what that is. So I guess the answer is no. <laughs> ok, ok. È un manga molto bello. Tra l'altro è il manga più venduto del mondo, quindi è, è molto popolare, diciamo. Ecco perché It's tanti commenti. All right, I definitely have to check it out then. Ecco, il tema fondamentale del Mostro dei Mari è la ciclicità di certi eventi e di certe emozioni. E è tutto quello che noi siamo disposti a fare proprio per spezzare questo ciclo. Eh, non voglio dire di più. E I film di, anim di animazione possono ancora, in un certo senso, influenzare il pubblico e veicolare dei messaggi importanti che magari la, le persone appunto possono applicare alla vita di tutti i giorni oppure è un falso mito? Well, you certainly hope so. There were themes in the movie that unfortunately feel like they've become more relevant over the course of the development of, of the project. And so on some level you're hoping that you can maybe give the audience a bit of a, a framework or a way to, a, to, to think about these things or even for younger audiences, uh, you give them a bit of a framework. But as an artist in, in some sort of small way, humbly you hope that you can You can make a difference and so there, there's always that desire. Beh, questa cosa la, la dimostra anche il tuo sfondo che ha tema con il film che hai, che hai realizzato. E a proposito di mondi, in un'intervista con Esquire hai detto di voler rendere autentici questi tuoi mondi. Come si fa? Qual è il modo migliore per rendere credibile eh, nella sua dimensione un universo narrativo? That's a good question and, and I suppose the making it believable, maybe the word believable is better than the word real, but that was one of the things that I knew for this movie more than anything else I've ever worked on. The experience of being in the place was going to be a big part of the experience of watching the movie, almost as important as, as the story itself. And so I would look at movies like Lord of the Rings and, and shows like Game of Thrones and Blade Runner as examples that had a really complete and, and comprehensive world, that there was a world going on outside of, of the story being told. From a design standpoint, one of the things that we, we wanted to do to help give that feeling of, of believability is give everything a sense of history, you know, get a sense of what, what came before. As far as the design and, and the culture and the relationships, that there, was a, that there was lots of history that led up to this point. And then beyond that, it's just all the little details, things that the, the audience may not pick up on, but you have to sweat all the little things. And that's what adds up to uh, an immersive experience. So even the paintings that we have hanging up in the, in the, in the back of the bar in the shadows, even those, even those paintings, we spent a lot of time designing and making them feel plausible and the intricacy of the costumes and the wear in the costumes, you know, the fact that they're actually a little bit more threadbare in certain areas, um, all those things, those tiny little things 
are what add up to an immersive experience. Vabbè, il world building, no? Cioè il realizzare un mondo credibile anche al di fuori di quella storia che stai seguendo. Eh. Ci tengono molto adesso nella serialità, nel cinema ed è il segreto secondo me di, di, un, di un buon film, di un buon prodotto. I agree, yeah. Chris, io ti ringrazio per essere stato qui con me e ti auguro un in bocca al lupo per il mostro dei mari anche qua in Italia, quindi recuperatelo se vi siete appassionati al racconto della carriera di Chris Williams. Quindi grazie Chris e in bocca al lupo per i tuoi progetti futuri per i tuoi film futuri e grazie davvero di questo prezioso contributo yeah I hope people check it out I hope people like it and uh, I'm sorry if my answers were too long I, I... No, 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 don't worry about uh, that. I, I forced you to do lots of translating, so I apologize. No, 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 grazie anzi dei tuoi aneddoti perché sono mana dal cielo per gli appassionati di animazione, anzi possono aiutare tanti aspiranti animatori e registi a lavorare nel tuo campo, quindi grazie ancora, Chris. Bye, 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 Thank bye. Thank you very much, we'll see you later. Bye, bye.